board here. So welcome to week five. Um, do you want me to draw a little concept map of sort of how this week fits in to what we know so far? Yes? Okay, all right. So let's start with, and I always start with our audit report. All right, because our audit report we know is our output. Okay, and I know that to be able to do my audit report or to, to have my audit report, I need to generate some audit evidence. Okay, and uh, last week we looked at, you know, the fact that we have to generate sufficient appropriate amounts of evidence, but we need that evidence to be able to generate our audit report. We also learned last week a little bit about the audit risk model. So, oops, the audit risk model tells us what our audit strategy is going to be. Okay, so our audit risk model, let's put that there, gives us our audit evidence. And there are two types of audit strategies. All right, so our first type is our substantive, whoops, I can't spell, substantive approach. All right, so we've got our substantive approach to the audit and we've got our controls or compliance based approach to the audit. And both of these approaches will depend on the level of detection risk. All right, so our detection risk drives our strategy choice. Okay, but how do I figure out what detection risk is? Detection risk is going to be linked to, and I'll just write this, detection risk is a function of audit risk. Oh, hang on, no, that's a mistake. I can't even remember what I'm doing. Uh, yeah, okay. Oh no, I was right, I've just lost the plot at the end of the day. All right, so my detection risk is my audit risk divided by my inherent risk and my control risk. And I know that my inherent risk comes from assessing my industry. Uh, so what we looked at here in terms of inherent risk, we looked at assessing our industry and our environment for risks. But where oh, does my control risk come in? All right, my control risk comes in from understanding the internal controls of the client. All right, so my control risk comes from there. And if the controls are really good, then I'm going to rely on those controls somewhat. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Now, in terms of my internal controls, you guys are actually gonna learn, I'm gonna add a new slide in this little pyramid um, I'll talk about how this pyramid represents a client's internal controls um, and that will help drive our audit strategy. So today we're going to look at what goes into this part of understanding the internal controls. Okay, And internal controls and the requirement to understand internal controls all comes out of ASA 315. All right, and you might think, well, hang on a second, ASA 315 was about understanding the client. How is that anything to do with understanding internal controls? ASA 315 is really broad. Um, so it covers the audit risk model, it covers thinking about inherent risks, and it also tells you to understand the five components of the internal control system of the firm. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to look at what are those components what am I looking for? Um, and what the hell do I do with this information about internal controls? Does that sound okay? Everyone's good? All right. So what are we gonna do today? There's a couple of different slides here. Um, and that's pretty much what I've already talked about, is we're gonna look at what's a definition of internal control. Oops, make my pen my highlighter bigger. So what exactly are internal controls? We're gonna look at some objectives, but I'll, I'll give you a little hint. The objectives 
are mostly related to the assertions that we learned about last week and the week before. Uh, we're going to learn about different elements of internal control. Um, this entity level and transaction level stuff, um, I'm not really, we're not going to focus on whether we're looking at the entity level or at the transaction level. We're just going to focus on internal controls um, because trying to differentiate them into levels I think is a, bit, a little bit counterproductive. Uh, we're going to look at some techniques to document controls. So how do we document this in our audit work papers? Because ASA 220 on quality control says I have to document my work. Uh, we're going to look at why we identify strengths and weaknesses in control systems and how that affects our audit strategy. Let me change that to a different color so that that's there. Um, and then we're going to look at how we talk with management. So this bit, last bit down here is what do I say to management when I find issues with the internal controls and how that all fits in with the organization. So what is an internal control? It's the entity's resources, systems, processes, culture, structure, and tasks. So if you think about, most people think about controls in the very narrow sense, um, and they refer generally, oops, undo. Yeah, change that to red and make that small. Um, we're only interested, you know, a lot of circumstances we think about just the processes of the firm, but what's really important as well is the culture of the organization. What are the control or the computer systems they've got in place? Everything plays a part. So while we might right now think about controls as, you know, the Opal card system where the train stops you from, the, the card reader stops you from going on and off, there's a whole lot of other controls that we're interested in. Um, so... What we're focusing on, though, is the controls with a direct impact on financial reporting. So a company will have controls over occupational health and safety, over discrimination, um, over environmental waste management, perhaps. But we're mostly focusing on the ones relating to financial reporting. Why are we interested in controls? Because when controls are effective, the entity is more likely to achieve its strategic and operating objectives. Um, anybody here ever rowed a boat? It's not easy to row a boat, right? Even if it's just one person in the boat, you've got to get both of your oars working at the same time to go in the right direction. If you only row with one, you end up going in a bit of a circle. Um, some of my students, <clears throat> I've taught a lot of, UTS is big on rowing, I don't know if anybody knows that, and I've had a, a fair few students go to the Olympics before from rowing, um, and we've got a, a current student um, over at the moment. But the students who are rowers tell me that, you know, when you're in a boat with eight other people rowing, everybody needs to be in perfect unison pulling together to help achieve maximum speed to win the race. If somebody's timing is a little bit off, or they're dipping their oar a little bit much, or you know, a whole lot of range of other technical things, the boat doesn't achieve its objective as quick as it would like. That's the same with an organization, right? Everybody in the organization needs to be working towards the same goal, whatever the goal that uh, managers have sh set for shareholders. Whereas if you've got people doing different things and trying to achieve different objectives that are not really headed in the same direction, your company's not going to get there uh, anytime soon. So the AUASB uh, handbook actually has a glossary, so this is where this comes from. Uh, their process is designed, implemented and maintained, this is where it's going to get important here, by those charged with governance. All right, so that's management, board of directors and management. Um, and that, that little section there is saying that it's not the auditor's responsibility to design internal controls or make sure that they're in place. Instead, it is manager's responsibility, right? The directors are meant to be the representatives of shareholders. They're caretakers of the assets or the money that the investors put in. So management and the directors in their role as caretakers and in charge of corporate governance are the ones who are supposed to design and implement and maintain these internal controls to make sure that everyone in the organization is working towards that same goal as efficiently and effectively as possible. So efficiency and effectiveness 
important. Now, in terms of these objectives, I remember before I said that these are related to the assertions. All right, and you'll see that down here. Okay, so an internal control is effective if I make sure that transactions are real, that they're all recorded, they're at the correct amount in the correct journal entry and then summarized correctly, posted in the correct place in the accounting, so again, that's a bit more uh, journal entry stuff, and recording in the correct, recorded in the correct accounting period, right? Don't get too hung up on these seven objectives because they're essentially just the assertions, right? So let me give you an example. For every asset, I want to make sure that I've got internal controls to make sure that all assets exist. I've calculated the value of assets correctly. I've recorded all the assets and I have a right to recognize that asset as mine. That's, that's simply the four assertions described in terms of internal controls. For transactions, I want to make sure that I've got controls in place to make sure that all my expenses and revenues really did, I really did earn them or incur them. They're recorded at the correct dollar amount. All of them are recorded in the correct financial period using the correct journal entry. All right. So these seven objectives are really simply just the assertions. All right. And so those assertions, remember the assertions come from ASA, oops, let's change my pen size, from ASA 315, paragraph A124. All right. So the assertions will infiltrate every single thing that we do in auditing. Um, now, why is this important from a client's perspective? All right. So my goal is to understand how we use these internal controls and they're going to help us do the audit. But if I'm a manager, why is it important that managers have good internal controls? So what do managers do every day? They manage resources and they do that by making what? Decisions. decisions, yeah. So they make decisions. How often do you think a manager makes a decision within an organization? Every day. Every day, multiple times every single day. And what do they use to make those decisions? Logic. Logic, yeah. Internal control. Gut feeling. Experience. Experience, what else? Evidence, but they would probably call it information, right? So managers within a firm, every single day, make this, well, I'm hoping that they're making decisions using company information. If they're just making decisions by using the magic eight ball, or a random number generator app on their phone, or consulting a psychic, then that's probably not so great. But I imagine that in most organizations, managers are making decisions using information. Where do they get that information from? The organization. Within the organization itself, right? You might have a few things external to the organization, but you're going to make decisions on prices and investments and discounts and production schedules based on internal information. So making sure that the quality of that information is good, is free from material misstatement, is free from errors and meets the assertions, not only helps the auditors do their jobs, but helps managers make good decisions every day. Right? What happens if you make, who's ever made a decision based on using the wrong information? Sometimes it's a little mistake, where you know, you've just bought the wrong product at the supermarket. Other times it might be a big mistake, like you misread a timetable and you booked something for 450 students on the wrong day. Happened to me once before. Uh, I once made a mis uh, the spelling mistake in some subject outlines and I needed to reprint 450 subject outlines. Uh, the accounting department was not very happy with that expense associated with that because I'd made a decision based on some incorrect information that I was looking at. So having accurate information for managers means that they're hopefully making the best decisions they can at that point in time. If you make a decision using the wrong information, it could be a small error, or it could be something really big that might cause you to, I don't know, sell off an investment 
or uh, you know, perhaps discount a product more than you could afford to. So it's really important for managers that they have accurate information, but it's really important for us as auditors. Now, as an auditor, I want to gain an understanding of the internal controls, and I do that usually using two different forms of collection of evidence. The first one is going to be the good old observation, and the second one is going to be inquiry or talking to people. So you know, we watch how a company processes its sales, or you sit with the accounts receivable clerk and ask them, look, what do you do at the end of the week with customers who are overdue? Can you walk, can I sit with you while you do that process? Or with accounts payable, you know, can I watch you process payments to suppliers for the day? So we do a lot of observation, then we do a lot of inquiry to follow up. And what's important for us is that if a control is missing or it doesn't protect an assertion appropriately, we have a weakness, all right? And a weakness is a, not a good thing for the client, but can help the auditor in finding the material misstatement. So I'm gonna do a little physical demonstration here. Just move that to the side. Okay, so imagine within the circle of my arms here, we have a pool of accounting data. Right? This is all of our accounting information and other information that we use for decision making. Okay? And what we want is for this accounting data to be true and fair. Right? For management and for the auditor. Okay? Imagine that the internal controls are a big dome sort of shield around our accounting information. All right? And what it should do is it should open to allow a correct transaction in and it should shut if it thinks that the transaction may not be meeting our assertions. Right? That's the whole purpose of an internal control system, so that the information that management use in here for decision making is reliable. All right? So my job is to figure out what is in this protective shield that goes around the accounting information. What sort of processes, what sort of controls are there to protect the accounting data? And I'm looking to see if there are any gaps or any holes within that shield. Because if there's a gap, all right, and there's just a hole, there's no control, there's just a hole where somebody could, I don't know, send a good to the wrong customer or give the customer the wrong price, then that is a place where misstatements can enter my accounting data here. All right. So what do I do as an auditor? As an auditor, I'm looking to find out what the controls are and I want to test the control. I want to make sure it opens and it shuts. Right? It allows the good transactions in and it keeps the bad transactions out. Okay? And if I can test that this mechanism to allow good transactions in and keep bad transactions out works correctly by testing that mechanism, then I can make a pretty good assumption that the accounting data in here is correct. Is that okay? Is everybody following me so far? All right. So that's what I'm going to do. If there are good controls, I'm going to do that testing. But what if I find that down here there's a little hole? Well then, where I find a hole or where I find a control that doesn't work properly, let's say you know, it opens but it doesn't shut all the way and it allows errors in, then that's a place where I'm going to start my search for errors and fraud by doing substantive testing. Okay, is that okay with everyone? Everyone's good with that? Okay, all right, so let's keep going. I know that everybody uh, who's probably listening to the recording is like, I have no idea what Amanda was doing with her hands then. Um, but on YouTube, there's actually a video where I go and I draw a little diagram, uh, same sort of thing on pen and paper. Um, one day I'll update it to do something more, a little bit more fancy, but uh, there's a, a YouTube video for that if um, that sounds a little bit confusing. Now, there are some limitations. Uh, in regards to internal controls. The first one, uh, and probably one of the, the biggest ones, is human error. All right? We are not to the point where artificial intelligence can take over accounting. Uh, is anybody watching Humans on the ABC on Monday nights? Yeah? No? All right. Um, Humans is a, a really interesting TV show out of the UK, which is a remake of a Swedish show where 
They have the synthetic human beings that help around the house and they can fold laundry and cook and do all sorts of different things. Um, but they don't have the intelligence to make big decisions. They can do certain things, but uh, they still require their humans to give them directives on things. And with a lot of computer systems now, even though lots of accounting is automated, right? Nobody's going to hire you guys to sit in their room and do journal entries all day, which is what 30 years ago accounting graduates went off to do, started off doing journal entries. Now we have computers for all that. But now we need people to interpret and authorize transactions. So there is still the risk of human error. People get tired, people get sick, people get distracted. Right? I accidentally printed 450 of the wrong subject outlines. It was for the wrong term. When I was attaching the file to my email, I didn't. I was looking at the wrong term, and it had the right semester but the wrong year, and I'd printed 450 for the entirely wrong year. Whoops. So you can have human error. Uh, the second one is ineffective understanding of the control's purpose. Who's ever done something at work and you have no idea why you do it, but you just do it because your boss tells you to? Yeah, that's usually some form of control that you don't understand. Um, so the more that people can understand why they're doing something, hopefully uh, the more invested they are in doing it well. There is a risk of collusion. Two or more people working to circumvent a control. All right, so a control is usually designed to keep one person from doing the wrong thing. But if you've got more than one person working together, um, and in that little Ocean's Eleven clip that I showed you, you know, they're, they're showing that video of the walkthrough and they're like, oh, this is thanks to this blackjack dealer on the inside who's given us this information. That's collusion, right? Someone outside and inside the company, two people inside the company perhaps, um, trying to avoid the controls. There is a risk around software. All right. uh, what website was recently hacked? published everywhere. Ashley Madison, yeah, which was a, uh, was it, I suppose they would call it a cheating dating site? Could you call it a dating site? I suppose, extramarital affairs site. All right. With so much information online, now companies need to be careful of what's available, how do they protect that information, because we know that with WikiLeaks and with hackers, you know, not everything is perhaps as secure as we think it might be. Um, I, I don't know if anybody's trying to hack KFC to try and get the Colonel's Eleven secret herbs and spices. But there are certainly risks um, around software. And then management have to make decisions about what controls get implemented. All right. What does super... If I wanted to stop 100% of theft from supermarkets... What would I do? What sort of controls could I implement? What do they do in prisons to make sure that prisoners don't have the wrong things? They pat everyone down. They strip search prisoners. They toss everything in their rooms to make sure that there's not the incorrect items in there. So imagine if you went to Woolworths and to be 100% sure that they're stopping theft, before you leave the store, you have to go through a pat down where a security guard pats you down to make sure you haven't got a tin of tuna in your pocket or something? Or what do they do at the airport to make sure that you're not carrying anything through security that you shouldn't? Metal detector? Metal detector? Or at Sydney, you stand in that big x-ray thing and you put your arms out like this and they take that big photo of you, all right? So imagine if you had to do that or if they had to RFID tag every single product in the store and it had to be deactivated like they do at JB Hi-Fi if for every single item at Woolies. Do you think that would be very popular? There's, there's no such thing as like a quick duck into the shops because you'd want to do it and you know, be fully ready for the cavity search. So from a management perspective, there's a fine balance between how many controls do I implement versus how much is that going to affect my organisation. All right. So there is this balance between what am I going to implement versus what's reasonable? Now, Woolworths and all the other supermarkets and retailers actually expect a certain amount of theft. Does anyone know what it's called when they account for that? That's with S. 
Not oh, well, spoilage, yes, definitely in fresh food, but there's something else. It start, also starts with S. Shrinkage. So if you've ever seen any you know, retail reports, um, often they talk about the term shrinkage, which is they expect their inventory to shrink a small amount because of theft, but the cost of implementing procedures to 100% eliminate theft is too difficult, right? Just like in exams, if I wanted to 100% eliminate the risk of cheating, I would put every single student in an individual room to do the exam on their own with one supervisor sitting right opposite you, watching you the entire time. That'd be a bit off-putting, um, but it's just not feasible. You know, economically, we don't have enough rooms for that. That creates all sorts of issues. So we have to think about cost and benefit. All right, so here we have the organizational structure around internal controls. I'm gonna redraw this. Because while the textbook has this little loop process, and it's certainly true that um, within the organization, you know, we want to start with the control environment, risk assessment, and then monitoring, and it needs to loop back. It's not a really great representation, I don't feel personally, of how internal controls work. So I'm going to draw my own. All right. So I'm going to use a big pyramid. Oops. Ah! As you can see, I majored in accounting and not in graphic design. Okay, so I'm going to use this to talk about the internal control structure of the firm. All right, so I'm gonna start with down the bottom, the idea of the control environment. And that's still, look, these are still the same bubbles on that little circle diagram but I'm just putting them in a way that I, I, I feel sort of represents the process a little bit better. So the control environment is everything about how the firm is set up. Structure, management philosophy, hiring policies. Who's ever worked for a really crappy boss? It's bad, right? You don't want to be there at work. You do the least amount possible. You're grumpy with customers. And if there's a way you can shortcut doing something, you're going to take a shortcut, right? You're not really invested in your job, okay? Who's ever worked at somewhere really fabulous and awesome and you love it and you're dedicated and you love the job? It makes a big difference, right? For, for those of us who've worked in crappy jobs and, those, and have gone to jobs that we love, there's a reason why being in a really positive and empowering and trustworthy uh, control environment impacts productivity. Think about Google Maps. Does anyone know the history of Google Maps and how it started? So at Google, you're allowed to spend between 20 and 30% of your work week doing a project of your choice, right? Developing something for Google on your own or in a team with someone else, um, and it's not set by management. Do whatever you like. So Google Maps started out as a collaborative project between three Google software engineers which is now probably the most used mapping and direction service in the world. And that came about because the Workplace Trust gave their employees freedom and time to do their own thing. And at Google, the structure is really flat. Like at the university, between me and the vice chancellor, um, which is Attila, uh, and I saw him walking down the street today, and it's like when you see the, essentially the president of the university walking down the street, it's like, whoa. And he's got no bodyguard. Like, what the hell's he doing out there? Um, but, you know, there's 20 people between me and the top of the university. There's a lot of hierarchy to get anything done. At Google, there's like five people between the junior person and the person that runs Google for Australia. So it's really flat, which is enc encourages dialogue, encourages people to work together. They've got, you know, the food and the great benefits and the games rooms and the sleeping pods and all of that other fantastic stuff, which I've tried to convince the university we need, but you know, never seems to get around. But that sort of environment, being in a really great working environment, means that your employees are more productive. They want to help develop new procedures and new products and work well with customers and all that sort of thing. So a control environment is a really big impact, has a really big impact on employee morale and how they attack their jobs. 
All right, so the next thing we're going to talk about is the idea of risk assessment. Okay, this comes back to MPO. You guys remember doing MPO, right? Vaguely. Do you guys remember doing threat analysis? No? You would have done strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, SWOT analysis, or you might have done uh, political, economical, sociological, and technological threat analysis. All right? So that sort of stuff is what companies are supposed to do. They're supposed to analyze their environment for risk because the survival of a company depends on how well they can understand their environment and when there is a risk, can they take advantage of that risk and turn it into an opportunity or respond to that risk in a way that minimizes any negative impact on the firm, all right? So companies that respond quickly are often more successful than companies that respond slowly. Some industries are faced with risk that changes more frequently than others. So if you're in technology or pharmaceuticals or nanotechnology, then that sort of stuff is changing really, really, really quickly. Um, even in finance. So which country is experiencing financial difficulties on their stock market? China. Greece, Greece has been in trouble for a while. I, I think we're, we're ignoring Greece at the moment. But China is the big one, right? They've lost a huge amount of money. Um, and even though the government does control a lot of the economy, the government no longer has sufficient power to stop the market from plummeting. So what they did was they banned large organizations from selling. They've encouraged government organizations to buy shares to try and prop up the market. And um, a, Chinese, a former Chinese uh, student of mine has said that in... Um, the area where he lives, the government is actually encouraging people who have savings in the bank to invest in shares to try and help prop up the market without disclosing to them any of the risks that are going on. That's really scary government advice, I think. So if you're a financial institution and you've got investments in China, you're doing a risk assessment every single couple of hours or every day about what do we do, what's going on, what's happening. If you're in the baked beans manufacturing industry, there's not a lot happening, right? Oh, there's new gourmet baked beans out. I just noticed a new ad for Heinz gourmet baked beans. But until that point, there hasn't been a lot going on in baked beans for the last 25 years. Salt reduced was the big thing, right? And we have two flavors, there's three flavors, ham, tomato, and cheese. So if you're in the food manufacturing industry for something like baked beans, you're going to do risk assessment, but you're going to do it a lot slower. Right? It's not going to be as time critical. Now, in response to risks, companies can do a couple of things. They can try and minimize the risk by controlling it. All right? They can try and insure against the risk. They can try and accept some of the risk or they can try and avoid, all right? Now let me talk about that. So in response to those risks, we can do one of those things. Let me talk about that in regards to driving a car. Who here can drive a car? Most people, some people, some unlicensed people. Oh, a friend of mine is 35, has no license, always lived in the inner city, she has no idea how to drive a car. Um, but f so for, if I'm driving a car, What's the risk? The risk I could be in an accident, <coughs> right? So how could I try and control or minimize the risk of being in an accident? I could stick to the speed limit, follow all the road rules, um, not drive while I'm feeling tired or impaired. So I could try and control the risk by minimizing it by things on my part. I might even take a defensive driving course. How could I try and insure against the risk? Well, I've got a Nice Subaru Outback, um, and there's a station wagon car, so I've got a child and I've got a dog, uh, and I like to go camping, so I have a sort of all-wheel drive type of vehicle, and it's expensive, right? Anyone who's bought a new car knows that a new car is expensive, and if I crash my car, it's expensive to fix or replace. So I have insurance to help minimize that risk somewhat, okay? Number three, I could accept some of the risks. So yeah, yes, 
I know that every time I get in my car, there's a chance that a homicidal maniac could crash into me or a drunk driver could crash into me, but I accept some risk that I could be in an accident every time I get on the road. All right. And then the last one, avoid. When do we think most car accidents happen? What sort of conditions? Any ideas? In the rain. In the rain? Peak, hour. Peak hour in heavy traffic. All right. So when the weather, I don't usually drive to university because uh, it's expensive from out where I live. There's about $20 worth of tolls one way to get from where I am to the university, plus parking, plus petrol, plus traffic. So if it's wet and there's heavy traffic, I might go, well, I'm going to avoid the risk of getting in an accident in my car. I'm going to catch public transport instead. All right. So if you're a company, you can do those things. And so the one I'm going to talk about next is the control activity. It is. Okay. And so my control activities are things I do to try and minimize the risk. But as I said before, there is a bit of a cost versus benefit balance that I need to think about in terms of my control activities. And a control could be anything from password protection to the library gates that open and shut to perhaps the lack of waterproofing inside the library when there was, has everybody seen the pictures of the indoor waterfall they had at the library on Monday night on Facebook? No? Yeah, I can't remember what level it was, but I've seen video that one of my students sent me of water pouring out of an indoor light fitting onto a desk and creating this huge puddle of water inside the library. So, you know, to stop rain from getting into buildings, we have controls like roofs and windows and waterproofing, but they didn't quite seem to work. So we have our control activities. That could be a manual signature to approve something. <coughs> At JB Hi-Fi, it's that salespeople can only give a certain maximum amount of discount without a manager's approval. Um, it's bank reconciliations, it's all sorts of things. So the company has control activities and then on the side we have information systems. All right. And our information systems, and the reason I've got it up the side here, is that because all around the organization we collect data. Data about what's happening to our employees, about the risks that our company faces, about our controls. So everybody's got like a little card that you use at the ATM, right? Every time you put your pin in and the computer matches your pin to the card, that's a control. And there's a record somewhere in a system that you put in your card and the correct pin was entered, all right? But what we also need to do Oops. is we need to monitor our internal controls, all right? So we monitor our internal controls and then we feed that back into our control environment and our risk assessment and our control activities. So what does monitoring involve? Monitoring might be um, uh, keeping track of performance evaluations for employees. Monitoring could be budget versus actual comparisons. Monitoring using information systems could be the bank getting an alert every time that someone tries to put a pin in that doesn't match their card more than three times. All right. Now, why is it important to monitor? So this is critical. If I don't monitor the situation, then I might as well not do any of that down there. All right. And that is because monitoring will, I'm really interested in knowing when there is a breakdown of an internal control. Because the breakdown of an internal control is an indicator of an error or fraud within my accounting data. All right. So at the Commonwealth Bank or at ANZ, 
Nobody wants to get an email every single time an ATM matches a pin to the card. But we do want to get notifications when the machine swallows someone's card because you've put the wrong pin in too many times. Yeah? So we can actively monitor every single time something happens or we can monitor based on exceptions. All right? Who's ever used, uh, who here, does everybody here have a Google account? of some sort, right? And when you log on to a new computer or a new device, you get an email that says, hey, did you know that your Google account was used to log on to a different device than any device you've logged on to before? That's Google monitoring security of your account. All right? So monitoring is important not only to make sure that this is working, but to know when the control stops working, when instead of shutting to allow a bad trans to keep a bad transaction out, maybe it gets stuck and it jams. All right, that's really important. Um, I think, can't remember how many months ago it was. Commonwealth Bank ATM started spitting out more money than people had asked for. So you put in twenty dollars and it sent you out forty dollars, but it only took twenty dollars out of your account. All right. That is a time where the bank wants to know that a control has stopped working somewhere along the line. I want to know if someone's trying to access the Colonel's secret 11 herbs and spices recipe stored somewhere. So monitoring is really, really, really critical, but all of this needs to work together. But the control environment feeds up to risk assessment, control activities and monitoring. Now, the reason I've got these in this order is because it is impossible for a company to control against every single risk. Just impossible. Um, so they make some choices on cost versus benefit. All right. So these are, this is really exactly what I've talked about, but just some slides about that. So the control environment, um, and remember before I talked about um, that we're looking at you know, ethical values, um, what about those charged with governance? Are the board of directors really active or are they just yes men to whatever the CEO says? Philosophy, who do we hire? What are those sorts of policies? Is there a lot of nepotism perhaps involved? We looked at risk assessment. Um, so how do they analyse risk? Information systems we've talked about and computers. Um, we talked about control activities. Now this one is really important down here. All right, segregation of duties. So in terms of controls, you know, we, can, we talked about performance review. Uh, that's a monitoring activity, actually. There are controls over the computer, right? You can't try and access UTS Online with a student ID that doesn't exist. It goes, hey, this student ID doesn't exist. Um, you can have physical controls like the gates at the library. Um, but this one is really important in large organizations. Different people doing different jobs. All right, so that is what this bit down here is. The person who can approve a transaction needs to be different from the person who has access to the asset and that's different from the person who has access to the journal entries. So that means I cannot go and order myself a, I don't know, $500,000 supercar with the university's money. All right, and then uh, hide it in some sort of teaching expenses, for example, because different people do different jobs. At a company, somebody who approves a payment to the supplier should be different to the person who has access to the checks, should be different to the person who does the journal entries. All right? Different people doing different jobs. This is to try and minimize fraud. And remember our fraud standard is ASA 240. But it's difficult when, remember earlier I used the word collusion? Sometimes we might have a situation where maybe somebody in this role and in this role get together to work around the internal control. And that's where we have collusion. And when we think about internal controls, we also need to think about, um, earlier I said the importance of uh, computer systems. So software over data and programs, uh, that's really, really critical. Is anybody here watching Mr. Robot, the new TV series? Now, if you're not, 
uh, homework for everybody if, if um, you can get access to pay TV or other forms of watching shows that I will not specify. Um, if you can, get access to Mr. Robot. It's about um, a hacking scandal and access to information. So you know, security of software and data and programs is really, really important. And then monitoring. So I talked about how you know, we need to make sure that we keep an eye on the controls, not only to make sure that they're working, but to know when they break down. All right, what do we do when there's small companies? Because small companies don't have 50 people to have everyone having a different job, so you can have lots of people doing different things. In small companies, you have lots of owner managers, all right? So the person who owns the business, works in the business, and maybe hires one or two other people. Um, and when you have uh, you know, a lot of owner-manager interaction, there's often not a lot of need for other internal controls because the owner is the one counting the cash at the end of the day, doing the banking, and keeping an eye on things. Um, but in smaller firms, there's often less segregation of duties, but more owner oversight. So at Woolies, or at you, you know, there's lots of separation of duties, lots of people doing different jobs, because the shareholders, the owners, aren't involved day to day. Okay? But you see different sorts of internal controls at different sorts of small companies, and I'll give you an example of one of those. Uh, my family, or my dad uh, specifically, my mum's a former school teacher, she's retired. My dad's always been in hospitality. Um, so when my dad's family uh, fled China, they moved to Hong Kong and they actually ran the quintessential Chinese laundry. Like, you know, Chinese people with laundry. Uh, and when they moved here, they opened up a restaurant, Chinese restaurant uh, in the suburbs of Sydney. And when my dad or my grandfather passed away, and, and it was a real family business, my dad and all of his five siblings worked in the restaurant industry, my dad thought he's going to move away from restaurants, which is seven days a week, lunch and dinner. And he decided to semi-retire by moving to a cafe. He bought a cafe in the city that was five days a week, 6 a.m. till 3 p.m. That was his idea of slowing down. That was nice. I got to see my dad on weekends when I was growing up. I, I saw my dad for little sort of brief snatches. Um, he would take us to school in the mornings because, you know, the restaurant didn't open until lunchtime. But I would never see him at night. Like, I, I have absolutely no memories of my dad ever reading a bedtime story to me because that was just not part of our, our life at that point. But when he sort of semi-retired and he bought a, 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 an Italian cafe, and, and yes, we are Chinese, he didn't cook, um, but... He had the most interesting setup. So what happens when you go to order a coffee at a cafe around here, like a takeaway one? Like what do they do? Who here has been to Knight's Coffee and Tea in the tunnel just near Central? Yeah? So you go and you place your order with a guy and he writes your order on the lid of a cup. You pay your money to him and if it's peak hour, you stand and you wait. And you wait and you wait and you wait until they call your name. All right, so there's one queue and then everybody just sort of mills around waiting. Um, what my dad did was he decided he wanted to serve people quickly. So he had this big counter and there were three baristas operating two very large coffee machines and you would go walk up to the counter and a barista would say, what do you want? And you would order and to keep things simple, everything was rounded up to the nearest dollar or 50 cents so that there was no like... 295 where you had to scrounge around for change. So you would give your barista the order and he would take care of the order and giving you your coffee. But instead of paying like a central cashier, there was a big bar top. Uh, the countertop was filled with coins, all different sizes and denominations. And what you would do is you would put down your own money and you would take your own change. Now, as a student, the first time I saw that, like, especially you know, studying auditing, I'm like, that's a bad idea, right? People could steal money. They might put down not enough. You know, there's all sorts of risk. And so I said to my dad, why do you think this works so well? And the thing, you would never wait longer than two or three minutes for a coffee, even when the place was like six deep full of customers. It just moved really, really quickly. And my dad said, 
well, I thought about my clientele. At the time, he was the coffee shop in which KPMG was housed on 45 Clarence, I think it's 45 Clarence Street. All right. So he's like, most of the building, you know, 70% of the building is accountants, ethical members of society who have to, you know, comply with the code of ethics. It's like, you know, somebody, people actually say, oh, look, I don't have enough money today. So they'll only put, you know, $2 down today, but they'll, you know, put $5 down tomorrow to make up for it. So he said, number one, my clientele are very ethical. So that was, you know, 70% of the building was KPMG. Um, another component of the building was some startup companies. And one floor was made up of a very special or unique clientele. And that was the chief of detectives of the New South Wales Police. All right. A lot of plainclothes detectives, but often a lot of officers in uniform. So he said in the morning, when people, and his customers were loyal, and he said, you know, in the morning, there's always one or two police officers standing in the crowd at any point in time to get coffee, often with their badges hanging around their necks or in their uniforms. So customers are much less likely to steal because they see the police just sort of standing right there. Now, the police aren't looking at anyone. They're just talking to each other or looking on their phones or reading the paper or having a chat to somebody. But just the presence of them made customers, oh, okay, I'm going to be on my best behaviour. He also said his customers, because he had all these accountants, everybody's always thinking about numbers, right? And they know the prices. So if somebody would try and put down not enough money or take enough change, he said doesn't even have to be a police officer, but his customers would tap someone on the shoulder and say, I think you took a dollar too much change. It should be $2.50 or $3.50. He said, I don't need other controls like a cash register and a person who would slow down the amount of sales of coffee I have by you know, funneling everyone through this one point. He said, I've got my customers to act as a control. That is the only time I have ever seen anything like that ever. Now, not long after uh, he sold out, he sold and retired, not long after KPMG moved out um, and then the police department uh, consolidated somewhere else. But the business he sold, the guy he sold the business to, decided that he wanted to go the, you know, write everybody's name on a cup method. And he said that the guy almost went out of business in six months because everybody was used to getting their coffee in a certain way and quickly. And the fact that it took now four times or three times as long to get a coffee in the morning meant all of the customers went somewhere else. Uh, because even when KPMG moved down to King Street Wharf, their coffee shop in the building was the slowest coffee shop ever. So people would still walk out of their way to go to their old building get a coffee, and then walk to the office. So in small companies, you can see all sorts of things. And I'm really, I'm really annoyed that, um, bye. Um, I'm really annoyed that before he sold, I didn't take any footage or videos of this because it is like nothing I've ever seen before ever. I probably never will again, but um, has anyone ever seen anything similar where there's like honesty system? No, so yeah. I'll have to, um, maybe one day I'll interview him. I'll see if somebody has some photographs somewhere of that. But small businesses have their own quirks. Okay. Now, what is the aim of a control? The aim of a control is to prevent or detect an error. Simple as that. Prevent or detect an error, any error, you know, relating to a transaction. So what can I do to prevent an error? Something as simple as I can only order goods that are in stock. Or the price, on, you know, if when you shop online, the price automatically comes up, like you don't have to type your own price in. Or that the computer system automatically checks your credit card so that you can't just type any sort of credit card number in. So controls are about preventing or detecting material misstatements. At the university, we know we have the library gate system. Uh, we know we've got our ID card system. And if you look at your ID, You'll notice that, oh, mine's really, really scratched. There's no hologram on it like on your driver's license, but if you tilt your ID in the light, there's like a little wavy line pattern on your ID. Has anybody ever noticed that? 
No? So if you take your ID and you sort of do the little light tilty thing, bye guys, see you next week. To ensure the security of the card, right? And we actually test that um, one mid-sem exam, I found four IDs that didn't have the little um, embossed thing on it. And what we discovered is that they were fakes. Uh, so students didn't want to sit the exam, they got someone else to sit the exam for them and they had a fake ID with the correct name and uh, ID on it, number on there, but a different photo. And we discovered it because when we picked, we, I dropped somebody's ID when I was checking it and when I went to pick it up, I noticed it didn't have the little hologram thing on it and I thought, hang on a second. And then when we went back and we checked every single student in this exam, there were 250 of them, we'd found four students who were posing as other people. Scary sort of stuff. Uh, so it's preventing and detecting errors. I can't enrol a student in UTS Online if the student number doesn't actually exist. Um, yeah, uh, simple sort of stuff. All right, what am I doing as the auditor? So what I'm trying to do as the auditor is remember I talked about gaining an understanding of the process. So I want to look at what are the major events and transactions. And uh, can anyone remember before what I said I do to gain an understanding of what the company does? I observe, yes. Somebody said use x-ray vision before. <laughs> they went, no. Uh, I, so I use observation and I use inquiry. inquiry. Yeah, the talking to people thing. So I use observation and inquiry to find out what goes on. Then I talk about the possibilities of what could go wrong. What are the points of failure? Could I accidentally order items twice? In the early days of the internet and internet shopping, um, this happened to me once before. You know, you press submit to order something and then you're like, nothing's happening. This is the early days of dial-up. You know, is it actually working? Did it work? Maybe I should press submit again. All right. And back in those days, you wouldn't realize that you've actually bought two of something until two charges show up on your credit card. Um, happens to my mom a little bit. She's a little bit internet less than internet savvy. I have like little picture diagrams to show her how to use the internet. Um, she still can't get the hang of PayPal, but uh, sometimes when I notice that everyone in the family gets the same weird kitchen gadget as a gift, it's because she's typically pressed the submit button a few times and she's not sure whether it's actually working or not, and then she ends up with five of something. And so she's like, here, have one of these, it's fantastic. So we have to think about what could go wrong. Could I send it to the wrong customer? Could I try and order something that doesn't exist? Could I charge the wrong credit card? Could I send them the wrong quantity? Any sort of uh, different options. And then for each of these items that could go wrong, I want to try and match it to one control. All right, so there's a risk. Why at the library, for example, do we have the security gates? What are they trying to prevent? Anyone know? You guys are all too young to remember a time when before the unit library had gates, the little security gates. In the old days, you used to just walk right in. All right? And there was a huge increase in the amount of thefts at university, especially from students who would you know, fall asleep at their desk with their bag next to them. Um, and so to try and minimize the risk of theft, the university installed the little security gates that require our ID card to get access so that we know that anybody within the library has to be a student. Um, and then obviously now we have security cameras everywhere watching all the student spaces so that at least if you see somebody steal something on a security camera, you can go through all of the swipes to narrow down your list of suspects. All right. So we have a risk that there could be theft in the university, but the control is the swipe access and the video cameras around the university. All right. Can anyone remember a time where you went to the supermarket and somebody would punch in the price of items instead of barcode scanning? No? Yeah. Fruit shops. Fruit shop, yeah, so fruit shops, you still do it. Um, but I can remember as a child, you would go to Woolworths 
And someone would punch in the price for every single item. That's how old I am. <coughs> so the risk is we could charge the wrong price. My mum would always look for cans that had been incorrectly sticker labelled. Right? So with the $1.99 instead of $2.99, she'd be like, I know the price according to the label is supposed to be $2, but can you look through all the cans and see if one of them has the wrong sticker on it? So that, because, you know, they had to charge whatever was on the sticker. Um, so now to minimise the risk that somebody types in the wrong price, now you have the barcode scanning, right? Obviously, it will these people, I've heard there's a trick of like you buy something really expensive that's a fruit, but then you try and put it in as like potatoes or something. <coughs> so we have to think about risks and... <coughs> and then try and identify controls. All right, so then once we understand what the controls are and what they're trying to prevent or what account they're trying to protect and what assertion they're trying to protect, we need to learn how to document the internal controls. All right, now, Oh, here are a whole lot of examples. Um, don't worry too much about these. For homework this week, has anybody read ahead to this week's uh, next week's subject outline week about what you're doing for homework? No, nah, nobody's reading ahead. It's only me that's reading ahead. So if you read ahead next week for homework, you only have two questions out of the textbook, but you have a field study question. What does that mean? That means you're going to go out there and you're going to document some actual controls in real life situations. Okay, um, so that's, I'm going to talk about that a little bit better, a little bit more, but don't worry, you can read these little uh, tables of uh, the controls. But what's important to note is that for each of the controls, we have assertions related to accounts. All right, so at um, JB Hi-Fi, for example, or the supermarket where they scan an item to get the price and the quantity, that control is to protect what assertion do you think? What assertion relating to sales is about dollars? Starts with A. Second letter C. Accuracy. All right. Thank you. So we know that something like barcode scanning is to make sure that everyone has the right price to make sure that all the sales are accurately recorded for accuracy assertion, okay? So that's what uh, I want you to look at if you're going through these. But we're going to do something much more exciting than looking at tables of stuff. Okay, so how do we document internal controls? Um, I can't remember whether I actually get you to do one of these for homework or not. Um, in the old days, I actually used to get students to draw flowcharts in the exams for the midterm, um, but it's multi-choice, so you don't have to do that now. But under ASA 220, which is about quality control, you have to document every single thing that you do. So ASA 220 and ASA 230 on documentation. Documentation is crucial because in five years' time, if you get sued on this audit, you're not going to remember what you did, so it needs to be written down somewhere. So in terms of documenting processes, there are th three different options. Number one, the story. That's the narrative, all right? And then the order the client does this, and then, and then, and then, all right? It's a bit like, dude, where's my car? And when they go to that Chinese restaurant, and they go to order at the little box, and the lady's like, and then, and then, and then. That's no worries. See you next week. So we have the narrative. So that's just the story, right? But the problem with the narrative is that no partner wants to read 10 pages of you describing how the sales process works. So what most organizations, or what we used to do at PwC, was the flowchart. The <coughs> <coughs> a diagrammatical method for condensing an entire business process onto one or two pages, okay? Um, 
I can't remember if I get you to do the, the flowchart for homework or not. I have to check. There's a combination of a flowchart and narrative. I've never actually seen this in real life ever. And then the questionnaire. And the questionnaire is like you, you ask the client 150 questions and they say yes or no. The problem with the questionnaire is that it assumes the client operates in a particular way. Um, and every single client runs their accounts payable or their accounts receivable or their inventory process differently. So questionnaires sort of pigeonhole you into thinking into one particular way. Um, and I, we don't tend to see them used a lot except in IT security. So if you're using a computer package, you can often, um, there's only set ways or a certain number of options for IT security. So often you'll see a lot of checklists and questionnaires in that area. So here's a little example of the story. Um, here's an example of the flowchart now. If anybody, has anybody done any flowcharting at their workplace? No? All right, so if you haven't, don't stress out about it. In the YouTube video that's in the folder this week, you know, that's not an essential to watch, you'll see that I do my flowcharts with all sorts of different little shapes for things. Um, for you guys, don't stress out about that. All right, um, you know, it's really just uh, the idea of we have a sale order, has the customer been approved? No, then go down this path. Yes, then go past down this path. All right, sort of a bit like the choose your own adventure books. Um, you just have it a, a short diagram. So after documentation, I have to make an assessment. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to assess where the control risk should be low, medium, or high, so that I can then use that use in the audit risk model. All right, and decision on audit strategy. Oh, and I can't spell. All right, uh, let me try and Okay, so I need to come up with a rating of low, medium, or high. What does low mean? Low is typically good controls, lots of controls, and I have no instances in which I might have uh, something that could go wrong without a control. Okay, medium, some controls but some weaknesses where there is an assertion without a control over it. High, lots and lots of weaknesses and lots of holes. All right, so where there's low control risk, uh, let me just check my slides here, hang on. All right, so I'm gonna just uh, add a new slide. So if my, I make my control risk assessment and, oh, oops, I meant to have the little pen thing, okay. I have my control risk as low or medium. All right, that means my protective layer is okay. It's pretty decent. And in that instance, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make the decision because detection risk is going to be usually medium or high, I'm going to take a controls-based approach to the audit. That means that I'm going to test the operation of the controls. All right. I'm going to test whether the library gate opens correctly for a staff ID or a student ID. I'm going to then take my Opal card down and theoretically my Opal card shouldn't open the gate. If my Opal card opens the gate, we've got a big problem and the control doesn't work correctly. So I'm going to test the operation of my controls to find out whether they are working, they work, or they're failing. All right, now if my controls work, they do what they're supposed to do, they allow the good transactions in and they keep the bad transactions out, then the amount of substantive testing I'm gonna do is less. All right, but what happens if the controls fail? The controls don't work properly. Can I keep control risk at low if I find out that the controls are broken? Can I keep control risk at low? No. 
So what I need to do there is I need to increase control risk, let's say to high, and then what happens to detection risk? Detection risk goes up or down? Down. All right. And that means that I'm going to need to do more substantive testing. All right. That means I'm going to shift away from my control strategy and do more of this substantive testing strategy. Now, what if control risk, if control risk is high, lots of risks, Lots of, uh, lots of weaknesses in the controls, there's no controls, miss you know, there's controls missing, uh, or there's big issues, then I'm going to go straight to that part all right, of more testing. Now what this over here shows us is that the auditor must be flexible. All right, the auditor needs to be able to adjust their audit strategy in response to what we discover. All right, now here, this is the situation where control risk is high. That's like having a bucket with a really big hole in it. All right, do I need to test that the bucket is going to leak if I pour water in it if I can already see there's a big hole? No, that's a waste of resources. So in this situation, I don't test controls over here. I go straight to substantive testing. All right. How's everybody with what I've just talked about? Is that okay? Any questions? All right. This is the whole purpose of the audit. Now, most of our public companies are this track down here. All right. They've got good controls. You know, there's not so much going on. Oh, one other thing. When I'm testing the operation of the controls, I also want to make sure that the controls are working for the whole year. Must work for whole year. Okay? Because if I find out that the controls were broken for one week, for example, then that one week is a week where we could have had some fraud or misstatements within the accounts. Now, if I find a broken control here, that sort of will pinpoint or shine a light or a target and say, here is a place where errors could have gone into the financials. That's where I'm going to start my substantive search for errors within the accounts. All right. So this is not a wasted operation. If I find the controls don't work, it actually helps me pinpoint where I might need to look to try and find errors within the controls. Oh, errors within the data. Everyone still okay? All right, it's a lot to take in these next couple of weeks. Okay, so we need to identify the strengths or the controls, but what's more important to tell management about is that we tell them about the weaknesses. And we do that in something called a management letter. The management letter is a letter from the auditor to the client, where I give them a list of things that I found wrong. Um, I'll typically tell the client during the audit and then I give them the letter at the very end. Um, and I present that usually to the uh, audit committee and board. All right, now, let me talk about the homework, uh, the field study. Okay, because we have two questions for homework this week from the textbook. And then you've got a field study question. I want everybody to make sure they go into the homework guidance document this week. Has everybody been looking at the homework guidance document? Yes. I know one of my students today gave me completely the wrong answer for the first homework question. I'm like, what are you doing? And he goes, the homework question. And everyone's like, dude, look at the homework guidance. There's like hints in there. But this week it's really important because there's a field study question. And this is the first week we're going to start immersing ourselves in audit. All right. So this is one of those subjects where because we're learning a new language, it's important for you guys to immerse yourself. So if you wanted to learn French, you do some basic French here and then you'd go to France and throw yourself in the deep end. All right? This is me throwing you guys in the kiddie pool. So I'm not going to throw you in the deep end, but I'm going to throw you in the kiddie pool and I'm going to say, go out there and I want you to document a process. 
right, of what happens in a transaction. Easier if it's a financial transaction um, in, in a business, at your workplace. Um, but I'm going to need you to take some photographs of the, the controls that you can see in place in a business um, uh, or an organization that are part of a transaction. I want you to document those with your photos. You, know, you can use PowerPoint or something to paste the photos in, perhaps use some little arrows or something to highlight or show the control that you're talking about. You might have some little text to discuss it. Um, three to four pictures of, of some controls. If you find any weaknesses that you can see, some photographs uh, would be good there. Each group needs to prepare one little field study guide, all right, of here's the company and here's the process and the controls and here's the weaknesses. You can do that in Word, you can create a PDF, you can use PowerPoint. Every group needs to submit their field study um, through, uh, there's a Turnitin link um, in this week's folder. It is not getting graded, all right? We will still choose one person to stand up and present their field study as part of the homework presentations. But for everybody else who's submitting them, they're not being graded. But what I am doing is I'm building a repository of everybody's examples to use in later lectures throughout the course. All right, so if yours is a good one, you might see it up here in the lecture slides as part of a demonstration. Now, if you're doing this at your workplace, Please do not take photos of anything that might be highly security sensitive or confidential but could get you in trouble. Um, I am only sharing this stuff with students, um, but just, you know, and if you're taking photos of perhaps staff members at your work, just ask for their permission, or you might just, you know, take a photo of the back of them so we can't recognize it's them. Um, if you want to use your workplace but you don't want to tell me where it is because you want to try and have some anonymity, that's fine. Just give me some basics of, you know, this is a manufacturing firm or this is a wholesaling company. You don't even have to tell me what you sell or what you're involved in. But you can just take a few shots and put that together. Okay? Does that sound okay with everybody? <laughs> so this is you and we're going to start immersing ourselves in order and there's going to be a few of these along the way to help get you ready for the final exam. All good? All right, thank you very much, everybody. Mid-semester exam information will come out tomorrow. I will send everybody, uh, I'll probably put the video on YouTube and then I'll put the link out on social media. So Facebook, UTS Online, Twitter, it'll be there uh, hopefully after lunch, unless something disastrous happens, but fingers crossed.